Um, well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, so, the, in relation to, uh, to to the history of English, the British trade trade union movement, I would say that um, what's possibly different is that the um, the, the, the socialism and trade union, the socialism and trade union and labour movement in the in England and Scotland, for example, grew out of possibly um, the chapel and the church. It grew out of the it grew out of a kind of Christian interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount, in in, to, in my opinion, um, rather than a particularly deep reading of say Marx and Engels. Um, and I think that um, meant that. Um, there was no, you know, in, in the history of, of the uh, of the labour movement in in the United Kingdom, the, the Communist Party uh, never were a substantial force, uh, nor were the anarchists. Um, and I think it goes back to the kind of original, po again, just my opinion, would possibly goes back to those original religious underpinnings of the movement. Um, so, and, and not to give you know a huge his, historical lecture, it could be wrong as well. But um, a pivotal moment happened in the early 1970s when the um, National Union of Mine Workers went on strike mm -hmm. and they brought down the Conservative. They managed to bring down the Conservative government, mm -hmm. and this really haunted the Conservative Party. Um, it it finished Edward Heath, the original uh, Prime Minister, the Conservative Party leader. It was part of the rise of Margaret Thatcher, was that she was seen as somebody who was going to take her revenge. And she very much wanted personally to take her revenge. Um, 79, she was elected. And then particularly the pivotal election was 83. Um, I, I do think that's a, a, a somewhat neglected moment in British history, because um, 79, There'd been so much industrial unrest, there'd been um, so many strikes, and um, they'd, they'd, an alienation had grown up with the general population. And so I, I could understand in, to some degree why people would vote for Margaret Thatcher. But what happened in 79 and afterwards, and, and, and the, the rioting in the inner cities and, the, and the, the policies that she was pursuing, it really did seem like this was unbelievable, she would be re-elected. But of course, then there was the Falklands War, and the Falklands War reignited um, particularly the English imperialist dreams, which the country never seems to get over. And um, the Falklands kind of gave her the kind of platform to then be re-elected in 83. But the, the main agenda that she had in 83 was to really wreak revenge on the trade union movement and specifically the National Union of Mine Workers, because the National Union of Mine Workers were the most powerful um, union in the country. And so then in 83, beginning into 84, you get this lead up of these pit closures and like the, they announce they're going to close this pit, this pit, this pit. Um, and so in the, in the early 84, when the novel begins, the strike begins, um, and, and, and it's, it, it then is this very much was seen on both the right and the left as, as this was the pivotal moment where um, the battle lines were drawn. Um, the trade union movement going in was weakened and also the government and the coal board had already stockpiled vast amounts of, of coal. Um, they also deliberately forced the issue in the spring, which is the, so, you know, there was a great split early on within the trade union um, thinking about really to go out on strike in March is a is strategically not a very good idea um, because you're going into the summer the demand for coal is obviously less and so there was a feeling that they could have used a kind of overtime ban and to kind of and actually they could have worked to reduce the stocks but 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 the, the, the moment came and the decision was taken and and the strike and the strike began and that that and and it was then um, a battle um, between um, the, the, the the trade union, uh, the, the, coal, the the National Union of Mine Workers, and and the government and the, and the coal board, and it divided and polarised um, the country.
Um, well, I, I mean, very sadly, she had many great victories. Um, but certainly, you know, I, I, I wrote this book in, uh, in, in 2002, um, and it was published in 2004. And this was during the New Labour, New Labour um, moment. And I think that the, the, you know, there was a, when, when I was writing the book, I felt a great anger um, at, at what had happened. Um, at the time, you know, I lived through it. I mean, I was 17. I remembered it. I, I had very complex emotions writing about it because, you know, I, I, I came from a family and a, a community. Um, you know, two of my great uncles died in mining disasters. Um, the community was solidly for the strike. Everybody in my family was for the strike. You know, we 100% supported it. But even then, did not appreciate the sacrifice and the suffering that people had made. I mean, people lost everything. Um, and you just felt when the Labour Party was uh, came back into office for the first time in so long in '97 with with, with with Tony Blair, you felt that there would be um, some form of redress, some form of kind of something would be done either to repeal the anti-trade union legislation or to at least you know do more to help the communities that had suffered during the strike um, and and these things were not done um, a lot of things were said but nothing was done and the book I think there's an anger at what the, there's an anger from my as I was writing it at what had happened at the time but also what was happening at the time I was writing the book that nothing was being done but it was just this was an inconvenient history for, for the Labour Party and for people in general in Britain Well, well, I, I mean, the first question is an easy one, is because I, uh, I, I mean, I write novels, so I wouldn't know how I wouldn't know how to write it um, in any other way. So that, well, that would, but, but also, I'd, I, so I, you know, I, I was uh, living in Tokyo, and I'd been writing these books about the Yorkshire Rip of the Red Riding Quartet, which was about the time and place I grew up, and I really wanted to try to understand all the things that happened to the communities. You know, first with this serial killer. And the, at the, which was at the same time as re, recession and deindustrialization, and then next the miners' strike, and these, these was just like one after another, these things happened. Um, and originally, I actually thought about GB84, like, like GB84 would be the last book of the quartet. But I realised this was such a such a huge issue that it was, and such a pivotal moment in British history that. Um, it, it couldn't be tacked on to the end of a quartet. It had to be it had to be a book in its own right, um, and it 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 was the moment I suppose for me as I was as I was as I was you know I'd come to this you know I'd seventy four seventy seven eighty eighty three I'd come to this moment um, you know as a writer and, and and as a novelist, but also it was as I say the 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 whole feeling that. Um, you know, here we are. Here we had a Labour government at long last. Here we had a chance to, to at least do something to right the wrongs that had happened, and nothing was being done. And it just seemed that it was being completely forgotten. And I do think uh, the novel, I thought, was possibly a way to to make people interested. You know, there's a lot of the novel is um, still um, partly crime and partly noir um, and I, I, I do remember feeling that worried that people would you know if you said you've written a novel about the miners strike people would be like forget it it's boring it's like, like because that that was the attitude you know of, of British a lot of British people towards the strike um, you know this was a, this was a huge huge strike that you know literally tens of thousands of people were involved on a day-to-day -day basis that the hundreds of thousands People in like the shops, the communities, the schools—they were all affected, and yet no one ever talked about it. Nothing was ever written about it. And so, I think now, when I, you know, because I wrote this book, it's nearly twenty years since I wrote it. I think now, when I look back, I think there's there's, there's elements of the book that I think are rather overdone and a little bit too extreme. Because I think I was worried about people being bored by the miners' strike. Mm -hmm. um, but the most important parts to me were the were the were the you know. The, the 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 two narratives by Martin and Peter, which I wrote in, in the I think it's the same in the Spanish text. They were put in columns. Yeah. Um, 
And to me, they had to look like biblical gospels because this is the truth. The, the rest, much of it is true, but obviously I'm, there's fictional characters. But Martin and Peter were based on interviews I did and diaries I read from five or six different people and everything that's in those gospels um, actually happened. Um, I don't, I don't, well, it's very kind of you to say, but I don't, I don't actually, you know, that's what I hope, but I don't, I mean, it, you know, I'm, I'm aware that sometimes people say it's a complex novel because there's, there's, there's many, I think there's like seven or narrative voices, um, uh, competing and it can be, I can understand it can be quite difficult for some readers to follow. But the reason I chose that was because as I was saying that, you know, this, this strike involved so many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And, you know, any historical moment, um, you know, it is subjective to the people that are involved in it. They're, they're seeing only their part of it. And I really wanted to show this strike, you know, from the right, from the left, from the top to the bottom. Um, and, and to have all these different competing voices because this was such a divided and divisive time. So it was really important to have so many competing voices and then to try to differentiate the voices. So, I mean, I, I tried very hard like to, to cover the differences like past tense, present tense and so forth. Um, and, and hopefully, the, you know, one of the, I think possibly the reason I chose so little description in, in many places is again this, I was actually worried that people would be bored. So I just wanted to go like to, you know, to cut, cut down and to write it so that it would be something you were swept along with really um you know it was it was this living in it it was something that swept you along um that's a quite it's, a, it's an interesting question it's quite quite a difficult one to answer um you know she was elected by working class voters in a, you know in, in many cases um, um, I think she remains she, she she is a very very divisive figure to this day I mean even recently they, they there was a uh, an idea to put a statue of her outside um, the Houses of Parliament but the police said you can't because uh, it will be vandalized it'll be a target for demonstrations. And so they put the statue in her hometown, but they've put it on a plinth that's higher than anyone can reach so that it would not be vandalised. I mean, that's how divisive she is to people. And, peop you know, I, I went back and did a series of interviews um, 10 years after this book came out. I went back to some of the, 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 the mining villages and did a series of interviews um, with with people who to see what had happened to them after the strike. And... Um, you know, people there, the, 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 the hatred for her um, in those communities is as intense now as it was then at the time because people will not forgive, will not forgive what she's done. But, but I think one, one point I would make is that um, the strike was in the media uh, was personalised between Margaret Thatcher and Arthur Scargill and you know, Margaret Thatcher is the personification of a form of capitalism which became dominant and which we still actually largely live under. And it's, uh, I think, the, the personification of, of um, these um, structures is, is very dangerous, that people tend to just look and hate Thatcher, but they don't think, actually, that it wasn't. I mean, she was a catalyst. I don't think, uh, I think it would have been difficult without her to have achieved these things, but um, from, from a right-wing perspective. But she's one person. The economic ideas, the people that implemented the ideas, the millions of people that voted for her and voted for her again and again and again. I mean, to me, they all take responsibility for what happened to these communities. And so I, I, I'm always a bit resistant to just, you know, it's a very... Kind of in, in England, it's a very easy thing to just be like Maggie, 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 out, out, out. It was much, much more complicated than that. And the fact that she's dead certainly doesn't mean that the ideas she um, um, 
popularized and 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 has made so prevalent in society have gone away because they haven't with the different regions yeah. yes i mean there was a there was a great split um between yorkshire and nottinghamshire for example mm -hmm. um and that meant that you know so so not not all but uh, but the uh, uh, um you know the nottinghamshire miners um um generally wanted to keep working but but not all of them um by any any means um and those mines were kept going sometimes and during the strike and so that divided then you know the the so yorkshire and nottinghamshire and neighboring areas you know i mean it's just it's just an anecdote but for example i can remember once driving with my father and when you got to the border between yorkshire and nottinghamshire you were stopped if you were coming from yorkshire you were stopped and the police would ask you, "What are you doing? You know, why are you, why are you coming? Because they didn't want anybody coming to try to kind of stop people going to work, and, and they really sealed off different areas. And you know, the, the, it was really region versus region. And in the end, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the mine the mining union split as well in in two on on regional lines. So that that, that was very divisive, yeah, to the to the country. Um, I, I mean, my main, my main, as I said to you, my main reason for writing the book was that this should not be forgotten, that we should remember. Um, I, and I felt that when it was published in, as I was writing it, when it was published in 2004, I felt that ever since it's, you know, um, that, you know, the, the, the reason I've continue to read from it and do events with it for 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 a long time over the last like 15 years um i i but i think you know what what which obviously i wasn't to know but um you know the the areas that most voted most strongly to leave in the in the in the brexit referendum uh, in 2016 were the areas that were most devastated by the miners' strike. Um, you know, the communities that, you know, are in the book that I grew up in, they were the areas that voted like 70 to 80% to leave. Um, and those areas which, you know, suffered deindustrialization and so forth, they, they were the leave areas. And so there is a, you know, this, this does not go away. I mean, the irony, I mean, it has to be said, the irony that a lot of the money that was Put in to regenerate those areas unsuccessfully, but but the money that was put in actually often came from the European Union, um, which is one of the ironies of, of the situation. But I, you know, do have great sympathy for the reasons that those people voted to to leave. Um, I, th I think it. I think it. I mean, it does. It, it does exist. I think that the publishing industry, um, the, the publishing industry, unfortunately, in the UK is is um, is geared against it, um, which is to do with the education system and the um, creative writing courses. And it's a very complex issue. Um, it's very hard for. You know, I mean, I, I wrote my first book and just sent it out to, to people and, and people in those days would still read it. They would, not, not everybody, but publishers would still read it. Very few publishing houses now will accept unsolicited manuscripts. Um, and this, this, I think, works against people without connections or who can't afford to do creative writing degrees, which is generally working class people. So I, I think... Um, you know there there is a there is a strong tradition in the UK. Um, it's often largely in Scotland actually has the has the greater, I would say, tradition. Um, and it, it, um, it, but it's um, you know it's it, it's um, I, I don't I don't really know how. I mean it's um, you know it's how 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 it would change I, I, you know there, there are independent there are small independent publishers for example it, like like i know of personally in, in in say the north of england and in scotland that do do a lot to promote that do do a lot to try to promote working class literature um it's i mean one of the one of the 
uh, I suppose one of the issues would be to what extent people in the UK even now think in terms, you know, that the idea of identifying yourself as working class in the UK now has, has really diminished, really. Yeah. So um, it is a, uh, uh, you know, it, it will be interesting to see, um, you know, what the literature in the leave areas is going to be. You know, I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, I, like I grew up during the miners' strike, you know, it took me 20, you know, it took me 20 years to write the book after. But, you know, I mean, I, I still hope that there's, you know, uh, kids in growing up in those areas now during this moment, like this, this pivotal moment in British history with, with Brexit that, are, you know, will be inspired possibly by, you know, a book like that you can write a book and that you can get it published and they might write the book about Brexit. Day 364. Mary's made a breakfast for us, packed us some snap and all, like first day of spring today. Beautiful. I follow Pete down welfare for half eight. Nearly whole of village is out. A lot of emotion. Lads that have been sacked are going to push banner. In front of them, Pete and other free branch officials. Rest of us will fall in behind. I'm stood there thinking, don't cry and don't look for calf. Don't cry and don't. But I look about and see big Chris with his handkerchief out. Soft bastard. Then we're off and I turn around. I can't believe how many there are. More than 50% still out. Easy. Makes me feel proud. Makes me feel sad to see us all here now, together, shoulder to shoulder, united, marching as one. Now it's too fucking late. Pete and them lot reach gates and call for a minute's silence for those who've died during dispute. That's when I see them. Not just the 800 stood with me here on our pit lane, the support groups and all those that helped us, not just them, but all the others from far below, beneath my feet, they whisper, they echo, they moan, they scream. From beneath the fields, below the hills, the roads, the motorways, the empty villages, the dirty cities, the abandoned mills, the silent factories, the dead trees, the broken fences, the stinking rivers, the dirty sky, the dirty blue march sky that spits down upon us now, the dead, the union of the dead, from Hartley to Harworth, from Sangendai to Saltley, from Oaks to Orgree, from Lofthouse to London, the dead that carried us from far to near, through the villages of the damned, to sit beside us here together, shoulder to shoulder, united, marching as one, under their banners and their badges, in their branches and their bands, their muffled drums, their muted pipes that whisper, that echo, their funeral marches, their funeral music that moans, that screams, again and again, forevermore, as if they are marching their way up out of their graves, here to mourn the new dead, the country deaf to their laments, its belly swollen with black corpses and vengeful carrion, Rotting in its furrows, it waits for harvests that never come. The day their weeping will burst open the earth and itself and drown us all in their tears, in their sweat, in their blood, in our guilt and in our shame. Until that day of judgment, there will be no spring, there can be no morning, there will be only winter, there can be only night. Lord, please open the eyes and ears of the people of England. But the people of England are blind and deaf. The armies of the night, the armies of the right, we are here because of you, they say, here because of you. And they strip us of our language and our lands, our families and our faith, our gods and our ways. We are but the matchstick men with our matchstick hats and clogs. And they shave our heads, send us to the showers, put us on their trains, stick us in their pits. The cage door closes, the cage descends to cover us with dirt, to leave us underground in place of strife, in place of fear, here where she stands at the gates at the head of her tribe and waits, triumphant on the mountain of our skulls, up to her hems in the rivers of our blood, a reef in one hand, the other between her legs, her two little princes dancing by their necks from her apron strings, and she looks down at the long march of labour halted here before her and says, Awake, awake, this is England, your England, and the year is zero. <laughs>